The Villisca Axe murders occurred between the evening of June 9th, 1912, and the early morning of June 10th, 1912, in the town of Villisca, Iowa, United States. The six members of the Moore family and two house guests were found bludgeoned in the Moore residence. All eight victims, including six children, had severe head wounds from an axe. A lengthy investigation yielded several suspects, one of whom was tried twice. The first trial ended in a hung jury, and the second in an acquittal. The crime remains unsolved to this day. Details The Moore family consisted of parents, Josiah B., Sarah, and their four children, Herman Montgomery, Mary Catherine, Arthur Boyd, and Paul Vernon. An affluent family, the Moores were well known and liked in their community. On June 9, 1912, Mary Catherine Moore invited Ina May and Lena Gertrude Stillinger to spend the night at the Moore residence. That evening, the visiting girls and the Moore family attended the Presbyterian Church where they participated in the Children's Day program, which Sarah had coordinated. After the program ended at 9.30 p.m., the Moores and the Stillinger sisters walked to the Moores' house, arriving between 9.45 and 10 p.m. At 7 a.m. the next day, June 10th, Mary Peckham, the Moores' neighbor, became concerned after she noticed that the family had not come out to do the morning chores. Peckham knocked on the Moores' door, and when nobody answered, she tried to open the door to discover that it was locked. Peckham let the Moore's chickens out and called Ross Moore, Josiah's brother. Like Peckham, Moore received no response when he knocked on the door and shouted. Ross unlocked the front door with his copy of the house key. While Peckham stood on the porch, Ross went into the parlor and opened up the guest bedroom door, where he found Ina and Lena Stillinger's bodies on the bed. Moore immediately told Peckham to call Henry Hank Horton, Villisca's primary peace officer who arrived shortly after. Horton's search of the house revealed that the entire Moore family and the two Stillinger girls had been bludgeoned to death. The murder weapon, an axe belonging to Josiah, was found in the guest room where the Stillinger sisters were found. Doctors concluded that the murders had taken place between midnight and 5 a.m. Two spent cigarettes in the attic suggested that the killer, or killers, patiently waited in the attic until the Moore family and the Stillinger guests were asleep. The killers began in the master bedroom, where Josiah and Sarah Moore were sleeping. Josiah received more blows from the axe than any other victim. His face had been cut to such an extent that his eyes were missing. The killer or killers used the blade of the axe on Josiah while using the blunt end on the rest of the victims. Herman, Mary Catherine, Arthur, and Paul were next bludgeoned in the head in the same manner as their parents. Afterwards, the murderer returned to the master bedroom to inflict more blows on the elder Moors knocking over a shoe that had filled with blood, before moving downstairs to the guest bedroom and killing Ina and Lena. Investigators believe that all the victims, except for Lena Stillinger, had been asleep when murdered. They thought that she was awake and tried to fight back, as she was found lying crosswise on the bed and with a defensive wound on her arm. Lena's nightgown was pushed up to her waist, and she was wearing no undergarments, leading law enforcement speculation that the killers sexually attacked or assaulted her. Investigation Over time, many possible suspects emerged, including Rev. George Kelly, Frank Jones, William Mansfield, Loving Mitchell, and Henry Lee Moore. George Kelly was tried twice for the murder. 
The first ended in a hung jury, while the second ended in an acquittal. Other suspects in the investigation were also exonerated. Andrew Sawyer. Every transient and otherwise unaccounted for stranger was a suspect in the murders. One such suspect was a man named Andy Sawyer. No real evidence links Sawyer to the crime, but his name came up often in grand jury testimonies. According to Thomas Dyer of Burlington, Iowa, a bridge foreman and pile driver for the Burlington Railroad, Sawyer approached his crew in Creston at 6 a.m. on the morning the murders were discovered. Sawyer was clean-shaven and wearing a brown suit when he arrived. His shoes were covered in mud and his pants were nearly wet to the knees. He asked for employment and, as Dyer needed an extra man, was given a job on the spot. Dyer testified that later that evening, when the crew reached uh, Fontenelle, Iowa, Sawyer purchased a newspaper and went off by himself to read it. The newspaper carried a front-page account of the Velisca murders, and according to Dyer, Sawyer was very much interested in it. Dyer's crew complained that Sawyer slept with his clothes on and was anxious to be by himself. They were also uneasy that Sawyer had slept with an axe next to him. I often talked of the Velisca murders and whether or not Killer had been apprehended. He reportedly told Dyer that he had been in Velisca that Sunday night and he had heard of the murders. Afraid of being taken as a suspect, he left and had gone to Creston. Dyer was suspicious and turned him over to the sheriff on June 18, 1912. Dyer later testified that prior to the sheriff's arrival, he walked up behind Cy Sawyer. He was rubbing his head with both hands and then suddenly jumped up and said to himself, I will cut your goddamn heads off. At the same time, he made striking motions with the axe and began hitting the piles in front of him. Dyer's son testified that one day as the crew drove through Villisca, Sawyer told him he should show J.R. where the man who killed the Moore family got out of town. He said the man that did the job jumped over a manure box, which he pointed out about one and a half blocks away, and then showed him where he crossed the railroad track. J.R. said there were footprints in the soggy ground north of the embankment. North of the embankment. Sawyer told J.R. to look on the other side of the car and said he would show him an old tree where the murderer stepped into the creek. According to J.R., Dyer looked over and saw a tree south of the track about four blocks away. Sawyer was dismissed as a suspect in the case when officials learned that he could prove he had been in Ocello, Iowa, on the night of the murders. He had been arrested for vagrancy there, and the Acela Sheriff recalled putting him on a train at approximately 11 p.m. that evening. Reverend George Kelly Kelly was an English-born traveling minister in town on the night of the murders. Kelly was described as peculiar, reportedly having suffered a mental breakdown as an adolescent. As an adult, he was accused of peeping, and several times asking young women and girls to pose nude for him. On June 8, 1912, he came to Velisca to teach at the Children's Day Services, which the Moore family attended on June 9, 1912. He left town between 5 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. on June 10, 1912, hours before the bodies were discovered. Reverend Kelly had confessed to the murders in court, but the jury didn't believe his confession. In the weeks that followed, he displayed a fascination with the case and wrote many letters to the police, investigators, and family of the deceased. This aroused suspicion, and a private investigator wrote back to Reverend Kelly, asking for details that the minister might know about the murders. Kelly replied with great detail, claiming to have heard sounds and possibly witnessed the murders. His known mental illness made authorities question whether he knew the details because of having committed the murders, 
or perhaps he was imagining his account. In 1914, two years after the murders, Kelly was arrested for sending obscene material through the mail. He was sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, the National Mental Hospital in Washington, D.C. Investigators speculated again that Kelly could be the murderer of the Moore family. In 1917, Kelly was arrested for the Villisca murders. Police obtained a confession from him, however, it followed many hours of interrogation, and Kelly later recanted. After two separate trials, he was acquitted. Frank F. Jones Frank Fernando Jones was a Villisca resident and an Iowa State Senator. Josiah Moore had worked for Frank Jones at his implement store for many years before leaving to open his own store. Moore repeatedly took business away from Jones including a very successful John Deere dealership. Moore was rumored to have a sexual affair with Jones's daughter-in-law, though no evidence supports this. Henry Lee Moore Henry Lee Moore was a suspected serial killer who was convicted of the murder of his mother and grandmother several months after the murders in Villisca, his weapon of choice being an axe. Before and after the murders of Villisca, the very similar axe murders on his mother and grandmother were committed, and all of the cases showed striking similarities, leading to strong suspicion that some, or all of the crimes, were committed by an axe-murdering serial killer, and just like Blackie Mansfield, the axe-murdering Henry Moore can also be considered a suspect in some of these slayings. Sam Moyer. At the inquest, it was reported that Sam Moyer, Josiah's brother-in-law, often threatened to kill Josiah Moore. However, upon further investigation, Moyer's alibi cleared him of the crime. Paul Mueller. In their 2017 book, The Man from the Train, Bill James and his daughter, Rachel McCarthy James, discussed the Vasilla murders discuss the Villisca murders as part of a much larger series of murders which they believe were all committed by a single serial killer. They conclude that the murderer was Paul Mueller, an immigrant possibly from Germany who was the subject of an unsuccessful year-long manhunt as the sole suspect in the 1897 murder of a family in West Brookfield, Massachusetts who had employed him as a farmhand. James started his research in an attempt to solve the Villisca murders, and with his daughter found archival newspaper stories detailing dozens of families murdered under similar circumstances across the U.S. The Jameses thus believed that Mueller was guilty of the Villisca murders as part of a killing spree that lasted over a decade killing at least 59 people in 14 separate incidents, including the Colorado Springs and the Poela crimes. The Jameses identify common features to these crimes, many of which are also found at the Villisca scene. The killer selected families who live near railroad tracks, seemingly struck in ambush at about midnight while the victims were asleep used the blunt side of an axe rather than the blade to strike the victims in the head and face. He used an axe found at the victim's home and left in plain sight after the murders. Covered the victims with blankets to prevent blood splatter. Covered windows from the inside of the house and locked the doors before departure. In Mueller's suspected crimes, there was often, but not always, a sexual motive directed towards a pubescent girl, as with Lena's being partly disrobed. In a blurb on the dust jacket of the hardcover edition of The Man from the Train, professor and crime writer Harold Schechter, Harold Schechter writes that the James offered the most probable solution yet for the Felisca murders.
To this day, there is no proven killer in the Velisca Axe murders case. However, we have several different suspects that we can look at when wondering who it could be. Who do you think could be the killer?